Our current series is titled Foundations. Taylor already talked about that a little bit during worship. We're looking at the 16 doctrines that are a basis for everything we teach here at Central Assembly. The first few of them are absolutes and are pretty much agreed on by every evangelical Christian church. These are essential doctrines and are what set Christianity apart from every other religion. The past two weeks, we've talked about the Bible, which is listed as number one in our statement of fundamental truths. We believe that the Bible is the inspired and infallible, which means without error, word of God. In other words, we believe the Bible, that all it's physically written by men, is not the invention of men. Every word in the Bible came from God. We also believe that since it's God's word, every part of it is accurate. God cannot lie. So if the Bible says it happened, it happened. We also believe the Bible is the final authority on every issue. Whatever we need to know about life can be found in this book. This is our instruction book for life. It was written by the individual that created us, and he knows what's best for us. Even if we don't completely understand why the Bible tells us to do something or why it tells us not to do something, we're wise to follow its instructions because God knows better than we do, and God always knows what's best. Many people question the Bible and question its reliability. They think it's just a good book. We looked over the last couple of weeks about a lot of facts that should prove without a shadow of a doubt the Bible had to be written by somebody other than men because there's too many things in there that men could not have known about so many thousands of years, some hundreds, some thousands of years before they actually happened. They're, they couldn't have known that unless it was given to them by a higher power. If you weren't here the past couple of weeks, you might want to go back and listen to those sermons because everything else we believe and everything else we teach here is based on the Bible. Unless we believe the Bible actually came from God, it'll be difficult to accept the other doctrines that we're going to be talking about. So today we're going to look at our second doctrine, which tells us who God is. Now, I sometimes wonder if maybe we have them in the wrong order. Do we need to know who God is before we talk about the book that he wrote? You know, it's kind of like the old argument about what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know? Do, do, do we have to believe God before we believe his word? However, the, his word is what tells us who he is. Everything we know about God is because we read it in this book. So we first have to accept that this book was written by God so we can then find out who God really is. Obviously, God came first because it would be impossible for him to write the Bible if he didn't exist, right? But this is essentially God's autobiography. This is his revelation to us about who he is. He said, let me tell you about myself. I'm going to put it down so you can read about it. So he tells us who he is. He tells us about his plan of salvation. He tells us about his plan for us, why we were created, what we're supposed to do. So hopefully, over the last two weeks, we realize this is God's word. And now we need to get on to what does God's autobiography tell us about him? Who is he? What does he look like? We believe that the scriptures teach that there is only one true God and that he has always existed. That means he has no beginning and no end. This God, although one, consists of three persons who are all equal yet distinct. Now, usually when we use the word person, we understand it to mean an individual being. We are all persons here in this room, and I could count all the individual persons. Each of us are separate individuals connected through relationship, but God is not three separate entities. There's only one entity made up of three separate individuals. Does that make sense? It's okay to say no. Together, those three people make one entity or one God. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's why so many people have trouble believing in God or believing in the Bible. They say it doesn't make sense. Now, if you're waiting until you completely understand God before you can accept what the Bible says about him, you'll never accept it. God is too great for us to completely understand him with our human intellect. There's nothing on earth that compares so it's impossible for us to completely understand the concept that I'm going to try to teach you today. I'm going to do my best. 
but I don't even completely understand it yet. God's thoughts and God's abilities are so far beyond ours that we'll never be able to wrap our human mind around them. That's one of the things that makes God so awesome. If we could understand him, he wouldn't be God. God is too big to be put in a box, and he's too complex to describe in one sermon or in one book. What we're talking about here this morning is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. Three individuals who together make one God. Some people deny the teaching of the Trinity because the word Trinity is never found in the Bible. Well, there's some other words you'll never find in the Bible. The Bible doesn't have the word omniscient, which means all-knowing, omnipotent, which means all-powerful, or omnipresent, which means always present. But we do find those principles taught in the doctrine, so we sometimes use those words. You'll also never find the word Bible in the Bible. It talks about God's word, but it doesn't say Bible, but we have no problem talking about the Bible. We even put a title on it. So to say that the Trinity is not accurate because it's not found in the Bible is an invalid argument. It doesn't use the word Trinity, but it talks about the concept. Augustine, one of the greatest and earliest theologians of the Christian faith, shared this insight about the Trinity. He said, anyone who denies the Trinity is in danger of losing their salvation. And anyone who tries to understand it is in danger of losing their mind. So who's ready to lose their mind this morning? Let's open God's word and get blown away by what it teaches us about this awesome, almighty, without compromise, God. The first part of our doctrine that I want to address is the idea that God has always existed. Now, if you just stop to think about that, it'll blow your mind. In our human understanding, everything had to start somewhere. Some of the younger people in this room don't remember the days before some things existed. But they know there was a time when they didn't exist, and they can go back, and they can look it up, and they can see who invented it, and they can see when it was invented. They can see all those things. They may not understand how we survive with some of those things. How did we ever survive before cell phones were invented? What did people do? And how did you plug in your television before there was electricity? These things don't make sense, but they at least understand there was a time without, and then it happened, and they, they're just glad they live now and not then. Everything in our world has a beginning and an end. Everything is either born or created, and everything has an expiration date, date or eventually dies. Ecclesiastes says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. However, I want you to look at that word under heaven. A season for everything under heaven. There aren't seasons in heaven. God is beyond seasons. He is beyond time. He has always existed. Now, it's pretty easy for me to understand, or it always has been. That, I mean, when I was real young, I struggled with it. But, you know, the thought of living forever, you know, we're going to go to heaven and we'll live for all eternity. I finally got where I can kind of halfway understand that one, okay? I still don't under, really understand what eternity is because I'm still, you know, limited to, to what I've already experienced. But it, it's a little bit easy for me to understand, okay, I'll live forever. But when I think about something always existing, I still can't wrap my head around that one. And yet that's what the Bible tells us about God. Revelations chapter 1, verse 8, God said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The first four words in the Bible tell, tell us where God came from. In the beginning, God. That's all there was in the beginning. In the beginning, God. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Just God. Nothing else. Just God in the beginning. God was there in the middle of nothing. And out of the nothing, he created everything else. When you stop to think about it, it doesn't make sense. 
God had to have a beginning. Nothing just exists on its own. But what other explanation is there? If God started from something, where did that something start from? There had to be something there in the beginning. What the Bible teaches and what we believe is that it was God in the beginning. He was the one that started it all. He has always existed, and from him came everything else. This part of the understanding of God, even though it's hard to believe and hard to wrap our heads around, is pretty much a common belief. Almost every religion on earth believes that God or gods created everything. The only religion that doesn't believe in God or of some sort is atheism. But atheists still believe... Um, minute. Atheists still can't explain where everything started. They say there, there's no God, but they can't tell us without God, where did things come from? There are many theories. One theory is called the Big Bang Theory. It says everything started from a giant explosion. Okay, but who started the explosion? What was it that exploded? There had to be something to explode. It's a lot easier for me to believe that it started with God. A God who designed and orchestrated everything than to believe that everything just happened by chance. So most religions will agree that there's a God of some sort. But after that, things get really fuzzy. Who is this God? What's his or her name? What does he or she look like? Is there only one God or are there many gods? Was God always God or was he once a man like we are who eventually became a God because he lived a good life and proved himself? Is the God of this planet the same God that rules the other planets? Or does each planet or each universe have its own God or groups of God? There are many different theories or beliefs about God, but as Christians, we believe that everything we need to know about God can be found in the book that he wrote about himself. This book, the Bible, tells us who God is, tells us how many gods there are. So what does God tell us about himself? Well, first, let's look at what the Bible says about how many gods there are. Nowhere in the Bible will you find the word gods with a capital G. It talks about gods with a small g because there were many gods that were worshipped throughout the times of the Bible, still are today, many different gods, but they are God, little g. They are not the true gods. God. Anytime you see it, the Bible talking about the true God, it's always spelled with a capital G and it's always a singular word, God. There is only one God. Nowhere in the Bible does it refer to God as being the God of only this planet. There is no council of gods or association of gods. There's only one God who created everything and is over everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, the heavens, everything. It wasn't just our heaven. He created the heavens. He created it all. There's only one true God, which brings us to the concept of a trinity. This is the doctrine that sets us apart from every other religion in the world. It's based on in part on the scripture that you find on the front of your bulletin today. Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God said that he is only one God. Now that seems pretty easy to understand. You just look at that. Okay, the Lord our God is one. Okay, I understand that. But we need to look a little de deeper into just that scripture. If we take the verse back to the Hebrew in it, which, was, which it was originally written, there are a couple of things hidden in that verse. Yahweh was one of the most common words used for God throughout the Bible. When the Old Testament talks about God, it's usually Yahweh. Okay? And that, we're going to talk about how that's spelled in just a minute. Technically, Yahweh was God's proper name in the Old Testament, just like my name is Jerry or your name is whatever your name is, when God introduced himself, he would say, I am Yahweh. That was his name. In ancient Hebrew, Yahweh is spelled Y-H-W-H. -H. There were no vowels in the ancient Hebrew. 
So when the Bible was being translated into English, there was much debate on what the proper translation of W-H or Y-H-W-H should be. So when it was translated into Latin, they decided to take the Latin pronunciation of, of the Y, and the Y in Latin was pronounced with a J sound, so they started pronouncing it Jehovah. That's the word a lot of you are more familiar with, Jehovah. Nowhere in the Bible, if you go back to the original languages, will you ever find the word Jehovah. Now, Jehovah Witnesses will say that's his name. Anybody that calls him anything other than Jehovah is serving the devil. Jehovah was not invented until it was translated into Latin, and they put the, ye, the J on it. So they're taking something that was created by man, a name created by man, Jehovah, to prove that they're right in calling him Jehovah. That was not in the beginning. But you know what? It really doesn't make any difference how we pronounce the Y-H-W-H. Is it Yahweh? Is it Jehovah? There were a lot of different d discussions on how it should be pronounced. Some argued it should be pronounced Yahweh, which is the most common one unless it goes to Jehovah. Some said it should be pronounced Yehuwah. Sounds Indian to me. Or Yahuwah. See, when you don't have vowels, it's hard to know what the pronunciation was. And by the time they found the manuscripts and started trying to translate it, Hebrew had changed so much, there was nobody around who could tell them, how do you pronounce that? Because even the Hebrews, even if they spoke the Hebrew, had stopped saying the word Yahweh. Because they were so afraid that they were going to speak the Lord's name in vain. They said, he is too holy. We cannot utter his name. So they had even written a notation. Every time it said Yahweh, they would write, above it Adonai which means Lord and so when they were reading the scriptures they would not say Yahweh they would say Adonai or Adonai nobody knew how to pronounce it so they argued about it so we've come up with Yahweh or in many translations Jehovah which are just our best guesses on how to pronounce the name okay now that's a little history lesson it really has nothing to do a whole lot with what we're talking about I just thought it was interesting thought you might want to do that okay when the King James Bible Society got up, was trying to put the Bible together, they wanted to make it clear when it was referring to God as his name and simply talking about God. So even in the King James Bible, you only find a few references to Jehovah. Because if it was actually God saying, I am Jehovah, that's my name, they would use the word Jehovah. Otherwise, they would translate it as something else to distinguish between God as an overall or God as the name. Does that make sense? So, if there's a, so in Deuteronomy 6.4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You see the word Lord twice. But if you take that back to the original Hebrew, that was the word Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh. But since the word Yahweh in this passage is not used as the name for God, they changed it to Lord instead of using the proper name Yahweh or Jehovah. So the literal translation of this passage, if it were simply translated straight across, would be, Hear, O Israel, the Yahweh, our God, the Yahweh is one. Now, that would be kind of like somebody talking about our church, saying, Hero Central Assembly, the Jerry, our pastor, the Jerry is one. Doesn't that sound funny? I mentioned last week when we were talking about how difficult it is to translate something into another language in another culture. I'm sure the passage, the way it was written to the ancient Hebrews, made total sense. But it didn't translate well into Latin or into English without changing it from a proper name to another word which still described who was being referred to. So now let's break it down a little bit more. Not only did the Hebrew language not have vowels, it also didn't simply add an S to a word to make it a plural. They had different words to be the plural of something. Okay? So Yahweh since it was technically a proper name, was a singular word. When you see Yahweh, anywhere in the scriptures, you go back to the original language, every time you see Y-W-H-W, it is a singular, one. I am Jehovah. I am one. Singular. There was another word for God, which would be used when it was a plural. 
That word is Elohim. That's the word that was translated God in this passage. And that's important because this passage is talking about more than one individual, or it's talking about one individual that is actually more than one individual. So it says, the Lord, which is single, the Lord, one person, is Elohim, multiple people. The one is many. That's what it's saying. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the one person is, or our God, many, is one. That's the literal translation. If you take it back, look at the plurals there. It's one God with multiple people. Now, anybody have a headache yet? Blowing your minds? Got one hand back there. It doesn't compute in our human minds. Because we've always been taught that one plus one plus one equals three. The Bible says when we're talking about God, one plus one plus one equals one. We don't understand that. Let me take another scripture, try to explain it another way. The first mention of the Trinity we see in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And we already talked about it in in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many gods were there? See somebody raising one hand. God, it doesn't say gods, it doesn't say in the beginning the gods created the heavens and the earth. It says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. One God, which by the way is the God, Yahweh. What, we looked that up? That was Yahweh. The one God, Yahweh, created the heavens and the earth. One. However, if we go, so we go back, oh no, we go back to Elohim. That, that was the word Elohim. It's translated God, one God, because they understood the concept. But you go back to the, in the beginning, God. That was Elohim. In the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. If you go back to the original. But again, it's talking about the one God with multiple beings. Okay? Plural word. But in English, it's translated singular. Because there's only one God. Everybody's totally confused now. But let's jump down to verse 26. Because if we look through Genesis chapter 1, we see that word God, Elohim, many times. In the beginning, God, Elohim, plural, created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. Verse 6, God said, let there be a vault between the the waters, separate the water from water. Verse 9, God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place. Verse 10, God called the dry ground land. Verse 11, God said, let the land produce vegetation. We see that all the way through. God, 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 always translated into English as a singular. But we get down to verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image. So all the way through, it's been one God doing creating. And now all of a sudden, God says, let us create man. Who was God talking to? Is he talking to the angels? Angels don't have the ability to create anything. So why we say, okay, let us, come help me create this. Angels can't create. Only God can create. So he couldn't have been talking to the angels. Was he talking to all the animals that he just created? Come on, lions and bears and giraffes, come on, help me. We're going to create something. No, he's not talking to them because they can't create anything. So who is God talking to? The English word is translated God, only one, but he says, let us, because there were actually three. God's talking to the other three parts of God. Over the years, I've heard many different ways to try to explain the Trinity. One you're probably all familiar with is an egg. An egg has three parts. It has the shell, it has the yolk, and it has the white. All three of those parts together make up one egg. That's a pretty good explanation, but it still doesn't totally fit God. And we're not going to find anything to totally fit God because God is God. Okay, but let's talk about, maybe we put these all together. Maybe it'll help us kind of halfway understand this. Another illustration that we've heard is water, steam, and ice. Okay, you got water. Sometimes it can be water like you drink. Sometimes it can be steam. Sometimes it can be ice. But that's all the same thing. I don't agree with that one. Because that's one thing that sometimes acts like one, sometimes acts like another. That's called modalism. 
There is a, a, a belief called modalism where they believe it's one God who sometimes acts like the Father, sometimes acts like the Son, and sometimes acts like the Holy Spirit. He decides who he's going to be at what time. Okay, so that means when he says let us, he's talking to himself. And when Jesus prayed to the Father, Jesus was talking to himself. Okay, we, we don't teach that. It's not modalism. It's not one God, sometimes being this, sometimes being that. It's three individuals who make up together one God. I've heard it explained as a corporation. You've got a corporation. You have the president. You have the vice president. You have the secretary. And together they are the corporation. Each of them are individuals, but together they make decisions as one. Okay, that kind of makes sense. St. Patrick Explain the Trinity by using a shamrock as an example. He said you've got the three different leaves of the shamrock. When they're together, they make a shamrock. Without them, you just have a piece of a leaf. But together, they make a shamrock. Any of these making sense? We're trying our best to explain in human terms something that can't be totally understood. Because there really is no actual human equivalent for God. The closest equivalent we probably actually have would be the human body. The human, we have the body, we have the soul, and we have the mind. Maybe that's what God meant when he said, I'm going to create man in my image. Well, on earth, it takes all three of those to function. If your brain goes dead, the body shuts down. If the body shuts down, the other parts can no longer function. If we lose our will to live, the rest of the body, we just give up. I just gave up my will. I don't want to live anymore. It doesn't take long when you give up the will to live before the, the brain shuts down, the heart shuts down, everything else shuts down. So that's maybe the closest equivalent. I want to try to explain this. As I was trying to think of this, how can I explain this? I want to try to explain this another way, and maybe this will make sense if none of those others did. We talk about the Trinity, which I've always pictured as a triangle. So I've got a triangle. Let's put the triangle up there. Here's our triangle. We have the Father, and I was going to have my laser pointer, and I forgot to bring it in here today. We have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. They are all connected. There's lines connecting the Father to the Son, the Father to the Holy Spirit, the Son to the Holy Spirit. They're all connected, and in the center of that, when they're connected, it creates God. With me so far? There's God. Three connected, we have God. God. But if we take any one of those out, if we take the sun out of the picture, go to the next one. When we take the sun out, all of a sudden there's no connection between the sun and the Holy Spirit. There's no connection between the sun and the Father, and everything in the middle of that disappears. Because there's just a line now. There's not a triangle. There's nothing to fill in the middle. Same way, if we take the Holy Spirit out of the picture, we have a line, we have the Father and Son connected, but because the other connections are not there, we've lost the middle of the picture. There is no God without all three. Take the Father out of the picture, same thing. Now we have the Son and the Holy Spirit, but we've lost the Father, so we don't have the other two sides of the triangle. There's nothing in the middle. We need all three. All three are individual, but when we put all three, and all three are connected, we have the Trinity, we have God. Does that help a little bit? Make a little bit more sense? There's God, the Trinity, three in one. Let's look at some scriptures that kind of illustrate this. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Two people. There were, there's two there. There's Jesus, there's the Father, but Jesus says we're only one. When we're together, we're only one. One, okay? Now, we don't have the Holy Spirit in that one, okay? Because the, the Holy Spirit would be also part of that one if he's there, okay? That's where we get the Trinity. John 14, 9 to 11. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? And the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works 
themselves. So Jesus says we are so connected that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. We are actually one. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about a marriage. It says the two are no longer separate. They are now one. They are joined together. They're supposed to begin to think together, to act together. The two things become one. We also see that illustrated in the book of Genesis in creation when it says the, the, the morning and the evening became day. The two joined together. The light and the darkness joined together to make one complete unit. If you just have the morning, you don't have day. If you just have the night, you don't have day. But when you put them together, it makes a separate, a new thing. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays his famous prayer over the disciples. In verse 11, he's praying to his father. Again, who's he talking to if, if, if it's one person that sometimes acts as the father, sometimes acts as the son? Who's he talking to? It's got to be a separate individual. He's praying to the father. He says, Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. John 17, verses 20 to 21. And I'm, I'm kind of taking some of the words out of there because this is part of the fist. But I mean, the whole thing, you can read the whole thing there. He says, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. You, we're separate, but we're one. You're in me, I'm in you, we are one, although we're separate. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus was talking about his ministry on earth. Listen to what he says here. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. So Jesus was also connected to the spirit. He's connected to the Father, but he's also connected to the spirit because he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. So I have the Father, I have the Spirit, I am a complete God because I am so interconnected, so intertwined with the other two that I, in myself, am a complete individual. But there's three of us together that make that. John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus promising the Holy Spirit to his followers. He says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So Jesus says, I'm going to send him, but he comes from the Father. Again, they're all intertwined. They're all together. You can't separate them. Three individuals, but one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all separate individuals, but they're one God. The Father is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They are all God because they work together. And I don't have time this morning to go through all the scriptures, all the times in the Bible when it talks about Lord. When you go through the Bible and look at every time it talks about Lord, there are sometimes it's talking about the Father. There are sometimes it's talking about the Son. And there are sometimes it's talking about the Holy Spirit. All of them at different times are called Lord. Which one's Lord? They all are. They're all God. The doctrine of the Trinity is that there is one God made up of three persons. Each person is equal in status, yet all three work together to fulfill the totality of God's plan. We worship one God who has always existed and created everything. This one God consists of three separate persons that work together in perfect unity. Each of them is complete in and of themselves, yet they are intertwined and cannot be separated. And that's why Paul in 2 Corinthians, in his closing letter to the, to the, to the church there, he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. We need to experience the fullness of God, which comes through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Together, we have the completeness of God. Also, how did Jesus tell us to baptize people? 
He said, go into the whole world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because all three of them are combined. We don't baptize in the name of Jesus only. We don't baptize in the name of God, the Father only. We don't baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit only. Because it's one God. When we choose to follow God, we're following the three. It's a package deal. All three of them are connected. Now, everybody that understood every word of that, raise your hand. You're doing better than I am. I taught it. I still don't understand it. I did my best to explain it. We'll never completely understand it. But what we have to believe is that what this book teaches is true. We serve one God. We don't serve multiple gods. We serve one God who is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You accept Jesus, you accept them all. That doesn't mean you're allowing the Holy Spirit necessarily to operate through your life, but he's there because you can't separate. The Holy, if the Holy Spirit is in Jesus, Jesus said the Spirit of God is upon me. If the Spirit of God is upon him and we accept Jesus, we have to accept the Holy Spirit because he's part of that. Three in one, the Trinity. Next week, we're going to talk about the third one of the doctrines, which is, is on Jesus. So we're going to talk about more about Jesus Christ and how Jesus was fully God. He was not just God's son. He is the son, but he's not just the son. He is fully God. That's the third, part, third, uh, third one of our doctrines. So we're going to talk more about this next week, and maybe it'll come together if it's still not making, making total sense when we talk about, more specifically about Jesus. One God, three persons. That's why he's God and we're not. Because he's the only one that's that awesome that can be three in one. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you for what you tell us about yourself and your word. And even though we still don't completely understand it, and we never will completely understand it until we're there, until we have a spiritual mind like your mind, there are some things we just can't understand. Because your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. You are so far beyond us that we can't comprehend some of these things. But we do believe what your word says. We sang about it earlier. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in all three who make one. We believe that God came from heaven to earth, and God died on the cross for our sins. We accept that sacrifice, and we say we need you, God, in our lives. We need all of God in our lives, not just Jesus. We need the three operating through us, giving us wisdom, teaching us how to go. Thank you for leaving your word with us, your autobiography which tells us these things and gives us instructions because the first book in the Bible tells us you're the one that created us. The rest of it, you're telling us how to live if we want to have a good, if we want to have a blessed life. So help us to learn this word so we can learn more about you because the more we know about you, the more we'll love you, but also so we can learn how to have the blessings you have for us. We love you, Jesus. Amen.